too many slides because I mostly work in terrestrial ecosystems, so I actually had to do some homework for this presentation, and I <laughs> learned so many cool things, I was putting everything in there. So <laughs> I'm going to give you a little bit of background about recreation ecology, what it is, um, talk a little bit about impacts that can happen to marine systems from outdoor recreational activities, and then I'll talk about a study that I worked on with a grad student on the coast. Okay? And, um, you guys get lectured all the time, so if you have questions and want to stop me, you're not going to throw me off. You know, I was a high school teacher, so you're just interrupt, <laughs> ask questions, it's fine. Um, so I don't really need to introduce myself anymore, but I will make a quick plug. I do teach some classes that don't have uh, prerequisites if you find this interesting. So this part of protected areas management class, we do talk about marine protected areas in it. But if you find some of this information interesting, but you don't want to take a bunch of classes from the Call of the Forestry, um, that require any prereqs. This one here, this Trail 357, is open to all students on campus. So I will do a plug for that. I love getting students from other areas on campus outside Call to Forestry. And don't ask me anything about trees. I don't know anything about trees. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I'm in the College of Forestry. Um, so your icebreaker was awesome because it's going to help answer this question. So I study outdoor recreation. So I want you guys to throw out some outdoor recreational activities. Snorkeling. Hiking, snorkeling, shell, shell searching. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that works. What else? Can be coastal or terrestrial, ocean, not? Scuba diving. Scuba diving. Kayaking. Kayaking. Is that it? That's all you guys do. <laughs> Mountain biking, hiking, yeah. Fishing. <laughs> Fishing, yes. Okay, so we know in my, my field of research that if we allow outdoor recreation in any environment, that some degree of impact from that is going to happen. It's inevitable. We cannot allow places to be open to outdoor recreation and not see impacts from it. Um, and again, this is a terrestrial system image, but I find it funny, kind of funny of the types of impacts that you can see, um, you know, in parks and protected areas that are terrestrial from outdoor recreation. So knowing this, there's this entire field of research that started around the late 1970s, early 80s, so it's kind of new, called recreation ecology. And that's, I'm a recreation ecologist, this is what I do. And the field studies these consequences. We try to figure out what are the impacts from outdoor recreation, and then importantly, how do we manage them? So the field is really applied. So I get to do some social science, some ecological science, and all of my work goes back to whoever is managing those places to help them try and reduce or mitigate these impacts so that we can allow recreational activities that we all enjoy, but protect the resources at the same time to make sure that these impacts don't result in compromised conservation goals or things like that. Um, so in recreation ecology, we study various aspects of the environment, and all of these can apply in aquatic and ocean systems. And so you're going to see bits of this. I'm going to talk about wildlife. Um, I'm going to talk about some sound impacts. And so when I teach my recreation management classes, I talk about each of these in turn, but I'll kind of mix them in today as we, as we chat through recreation and marine systems. So what's really interesting about this is I was like, oh, I'm just going to go on Google Scholar and find a review paper and make my presentation. And there's none. <laughs> so <laughs> impacts in these marine systems from recreation and tourism is really important. And scientists recognize that. But it's heavily understudied. And so um, there's not a ton of literature out there. And part of that is because these studies are spread across different fields. So recreation and tourism, they're similar, but we're kind of different. So um, tourism studies don't always overlap with recreation. If you have questions about that, I can explain it. But some recreation research looks at marine impacts. Some tourism does. Marine biology stuff does. We have lots of social science that does. And it hasn't really been pulled together into kind of saying, like, this is the general knowledge around recreation impacts. And part of that is because in marine systems, I'm sure as you guys know, some of these things can be hard to quantify, and they can be fairly dispersed which is really different from the things that I typically study, like social trails. I just need to walk along a trail and it's right there, and I see it, and I can map it and measure it really easily. Um, and so as recreation ecology, we're kind of at this forefront of there's a lot more to understand. So some of the things we do know is that impacts to marine systems can be direct impacts or indirect impacts, and we see this in terrestrial systems too. Direct impacts are things often like fishing or taking of resources. Indirect impacts can just happen from having a recreational activity there. So from just being on a beach, you can cause an impact. From just being in the ocean in a boat, you can cause an impact. And so um, I'm going to talk about these differences and some studies related to them. So again, direct impact requires some sort of contact 
between the recreationists and whatever the resource is. Um, does anyone know where this is? It's a national park in Florida. Biscay National Park. It's crazy high use. Um, they have a lot of direct impacts. Um, so in this game, they had such high boat use, especially during the nice times of the year, that they were having serious damage to their reefs and seagrass from boaters um, kind of grounding their boats or um, dropping anchors where they shouldn't or entering shallow water when they didn't realize it was shallow. And so that's an example of a direct impact. Those boats are directly impacting with the resource and causing damage. In the case of Bisney, if you damage it, you have to pay for the restoration. <laughs> that was their management <laughs> action, which is like very extreme for national parks. But when you have this many recreationists in a place that's meant to be protecting resources, they had to take kind of extreme action. Um, indirect impacts is when you have some sort of modification of the habitat, like having recreational activities there. Um, and again, you can see changes in behavior. This often is very common in wildlife just from there being recreationists. Um, so, this is really understudied, so this is one of the few studies I could find where uh, researchers were studying marine iguanas in the Galapagos Islands, and they found that on the islands that had high recreation use, even recreations weren't touching the iguanas, you can't do that, they were just being nearby them. And because of that, these iguanas had higher stress hormones, a decreased immune system, and they actually found some information that they could, could impact their reproduction. So some of them weren't that fit, they didn't have as much fat on them, and they might not be able to reproduce as well. So again, recreationists aren't doing anything to stress these out, they're not chasing them around, they're just there, and that can impact um, marine wildlife. We can also see different impacts in marine systems. We're thinking about the infrastructure that we put in for recreation activities versus the activities themselves. And this was super cool to me because I'd never thought about this until I started preparing for this presentation. <laughs> so, in order to have recreational activities in marine systems, sometimes we have to install things, right? Like docks for boats, um, pontoons for scuba diving. Um, some places have these nets to keep sharks out. And this infrastructure can have positive and negative impacts, which is fascinating to me. So, seahorses love to hang out on some of these things. Docks can be great for other sessile organisms. Um, like mollusks and other things that want to attach to something that doesn't move. And so you can actually create habitat for some species by putting in this infrastructure. Um, I rarely talk about positive impacts in recreation, so this is a cool one for me to learn about. Um, oh yeah, just talked about that. But these infrastructures can also lead to pollutants entering the system, can also result in damage during construction, so they're not all positive. Activities, things like surfing, a lot of the ones you mentioned, scuba diving, um, snorkeling, walking on beaches, those impacts vary by the type of activity you're doing. Um, and they're going to vary a little bit about whether you're on a coastal terrestrial system, like a beach, or whether you're actually in the ocean itself. And regardless of activity type, impacts can be direct or indirect. So you can be swimming and touching wildlife, which you should be doing, and that's a direct impact. Or again, indirect from just kind of being there. Does that make sense? Um, so I'm going to explore this idea of differences in impacts whether we're talking about terrestrial coastal systems or whether we're talking about in the water itself. So these terrestrial systems I'm thinking about are you know, rocky shores, beaches. Um, one of the papers I saw included like wet wetlands and estuaries and that as well and mangroves. Um, and so here, the most common impact we see is from trampling. Does that make sense what that is? Just like stomping on things, <laughs> walking on things. Um, and so, and we see these direct impacts fairly regularly. So trampling on these beaches has been found to actually change the makeup of the benthic communities that are found there. So the organisms that live there in terms of biodiversity and abundance can change. Algae are also really sensitive. But there have been some studies that show that some mollusks actually do better with slight disturbance. So a little bit of trampling on these beach systems can actually make it a better habitat for them. So that's interesting too. We can then again have these indirect impacts, and I'm going to talk about a case study of one of those in a minute. And um, again, this is just by being there, you can disturb habitat, and shorebird species have been studied heavily in this. If you go to the recreation ecology litter and you look like recreation ecology and shorebirds, you're going to find a bunch of stuff um, because it's a little easier to measure kind of their responses and their impacts. So that is one of the kind of heaviest study kind of groups of organisms when we look at the recreation ecology literature and marine systems. 
When we're talking about actually being in the water, um, again, the type of impact is going to vary by activity type. And I'm not going to touch on some of these other unintended impacts that are also really important today, but just want to acknowledge that recreationists can also introduce kind of non-native or invasive species into these systems. They can also result in putting direct pollutants into the water. And so I'm not going to highlight any studies from that, but I know want you to kind of forget about that as a type of impact. So um, if the activity is motorized or non-motorized, the type of impact is going to vary. Um, this is my dad's boat. He is as he got older, he got into vintage speed, speed boats. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my dad's boat that they take out in the, in the um, Bay of the Ocean on the, the East Coast. Um, so he's really happy I was doing that. Uh, and then we think about non-motorized activities. And again, they both of them impact the environment, but in different ways. So motorized vessels with motors, we're thinking about um, kind of uh, coastal areas. It can be about OHVs on dunes and things like that. Um, they can lead to direct impacts. Again, the most common one, which I mentioned with Biscayne National Park, we can have damages to reefs or other ecosystem structures from the boats. Um, unfortunately, we can have direct hits to marine wildlife, which is a direct impact. Pollutants, um, turbulence or turbidity. Do you guys know what those words mean? Are we good? Is that what you mean? Okay. So turbulence, I have to just define that for my students frequently. Um, turbulence and turbidity from having these boats in the water. And then again, I mentioned um, in a lot of coastal terrestrial systems, especially beaches with dunes, those are really attractive places for OHV use. And so those can result in habitat damage um, and damage to native species. The indirect impacts from motorized use can be things, again, just the presence. And one that's been studied heavily is the impact of noise. So there was a study in the Great Barrier Reef where they played back the sounds of motorboats under the water to kind of uh, do an experiment to see like, okay, if there were boats here, what, how might the, the, the fish species respond? And one of the things they found is that when that system is exposed to artificial motorboat sounds, the prey species, a lot of the prey fish, um, kind of display a stress behavior where they're kind of seeking around and moving around a lot more and they're not paying attention to the predators. And so in these systems where they had these artificial sounds, predator fish ate twice as many prey as in areas that were quiet. And so it can change the behavior. There's also been some in instances where just having boat generated noise, even at really, really low levels, can displace species from that habitat. And so again, even if it doesn't sound that loud to us, it can be incredibly disruptive to wildlife species. Um, Non-motorized activities, uh, swimming, scuba diving, and things can also damage reefs. People can also interact with wildlife and do things they shouldn't, like feeding. An interesting thing I learned is that male scuba divers are more likely to impact reefs than females. <laughs> so that was really interesting to me. <laughs> the authors didn't really explain why. I don't know if the male scuba divers are less careful. Um, but, but that was a study that they found that... Um, that scuba divers is usually from fintechs and things like that and just uh, not paying much attention, but that, the one study I read about that, that was a key finding. Uh, they also found that the Cayman Islands areas that had really high scuba use had um, higher instances of, again of dead corals or coral rubble, again, from, from folks just kind of either inexperienced or just not being careful. We can have, again, these indirect presence from non-motorized activity. Um, some whale species have been shown to th show threat displays when they're close to swimmers, and that can take up energy that they may not have been using otherwise, and can then cause impact. So even if it's just a difference in behavior, if they weren't going to maybe do that behavior if the swimmers weren't there, that can affect them later. And then um, there's been some studies that have shown that dolphins in Hawaii avoid their resting bays when swimmer use is there. So if they're swimmers, they're less likely to go use those bays. We also talk about consumptive versus non-consumptive recreation. So again, consumptive is when you're taking a resource, like fishing. Non-consumptive is often wildlife viewing. Consumptive is always a direct impact because you are taking a resource, right? So this would be collecting shellfish, fishing. Um, some studies in the Great Barrier Reef, as a lot of this recreation ecology work has been done, has shown that areas that are fished show, which this seems obvious, show less densities, lower abundance, lower biomass of species in areas that are not fished. Makes sense, but need to study to show it. 
Um, but so a couple other studies have actually shown that in other systems outside the Great Barrier Reef, you don't actually see that much difference in terms of abundance and diversity in areas that are fished that are not. And this is recreational fishing, not commercial. It's a whole other beast. <laughs> Non-consumptive activities are again these wildlife viewing activities like bird watching, whale watching, um, swimming with marine life. Uh, some impacts that have they found is that besides uh, boat strikes, which is very direct, sometimes recreators just don't know any better and feed them or interact with them in other ways, which again changes behavior and can result in species using resources in a way they may not have otherwise. And then again, we can just have these indirect impacts from disturbance behaviors. And so one of the studies that I found was pretty interesting is that seabirds, if there are boats nearby, they're less likely to forage. So if there's boats, even though it might not appear as if there is an impact, their behaviors change by not foraging and can result in them getting fewer resources. So questions on that? I went through that really fast to make sure I get to my case study. Did you learn some things? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so I mentioned that recreation ecology, we're really trying to reduce and mitigate these impacts, right? We want to know what they are, and then once we know what they are, how can we reduce them? And we kind of have two ways we can do this. And hopefully by this lecture, I'm going to change the way you think about things when you recreate, and what managers are doing. <laughs> so we can have direct management actions where we're trying to change your behavior directly. This is things like fencing, right? Or or um, building trails a certain way. Uh, but fencing in coastal systems is the most common thing you'll see. Or closing places off, um, or like zoning systems that you'll see in a lot of marine protected areas. We can also use indirect management, which is what recreationists prefer. And this is education or outreach. So how many of you have seen interpretive signs when you go to the coast? How many of you read them? You should always read them. <laughs> Please read them. <laughs> These are ways that managers are trying to get information across to, in, to encourage you to make a better decision in terms of your recreation behavior. So we have these two types of things that we can do to manage. And I'm going to talk about a case study out of my lab on Oregon coast in the Oregon News National Recreation Area. We're trying to protect western snowy plovers. And again, shorebirds heavily studied, so not surprising that that's what we were funded to work on. How many of you have been to Oregon Dunes National Recreation Area? Okay, it's near Florence. Okay. So there's a lot of OHB use there, but that's, that's not all. Um, so this is on the Oregon coast. It's managed by the Forest Service. It's a national recreation area, which means there's kind of extra levels of protection. Um, and there's beach access and campgrounds. And there's numerous nesting beaches for western snowy plovers. How many of you know anything about snowy plovers? Have you heard of snowy plovers? Does anyone know much about their biology? I don't want to tell you things you already know. Okay, one well, person. You want to teach this part? I think that's <laughs> <laughs> These are snowy clovers. They're so cute. I don't get to put cute oh, pictures cool. in my presentations very often because I usually study vegetation. Yeah, These are adorable. So this is an adult. This is a chick. What do you notice about the chick's coloring? Yeah, one's in the sand. So where do you think these birds lay their eggs? In the sand. Yep. So western snowy plovers, they're shorebird, they nest in open sand, so they need kind of open sand um, without kind of any sorts of grass or anything in there. Um, the females lay about three eggs per clutch, and they take about a month to, in, um, to incubate. And once the eggs hatch, the female will go find another mate and lay more eggs, and the dad takes care of the chicks. So the female can lay up to three clutches per year. And this, this parental thing is important in a minute. So peak plover season, just because of when they lay their eggs and the hatching is July and August, which is also peak what on the coast? Tourism. Tourism, yes, peak tourism. So we have all these adorable little birds running all over the beach at the same time we have all of us running all over the beach. So when they hatch, the males take care of these chicks. Um, and they feed at the rack line. Do you guys know what that is? Yeah, I don't have to define that either. So it's where, it's kind of where the tide comes in and lots of yummy things kind of line up. Um, and so if you've ever seen the Pixar short uh, piper, that was a piping plover, but it's the same behavior. They run back and forth, they run to the rack line, they eat, and then they run away from the water. Um, and because of this behavior, because they're out on the open sand, they're very vulnerable to predation. These little baby chicks can hypothermia and hypother hypo, what am I trying to say? Become hypothermic, there we go. In the wind, you all have been to the Oregon coast in the summer, it is not warm. <laughs> so when it's windy, 
They can get really cold and the dad can come and warm them up, but if the dad's not nearby, they can actually freeze to death. They can also become crushed. So when they get scared, what do you think the chicks do? Huddle. And they blend in and people or tires can run over them and crush them. So that's very sad, bad. Um, and then they can have this indirect impact from humans, um, which, okay, I thought I had another slide, I don't know what I'll tell you about. So does anyone know what a killdeer is? Killdeer, it's a bird, kind of, okay. So a killdeer is a, it's a terrestrial bird species. They also lay eggs in open areas. And when a, a person approaches them, they pretend like they have a broken wing and they run away because they think you're a predator. And they want the predator to be drawn to them instead of their offspring. So that is what the male snowy plovers do. So when a person comes by, they think you're a threat. They run away, leave their chick behind, and the chick can again either freeze to death, get crushed, be susceptible to predators. So as a recreationist, you're having this impact to this bird, but you don't see this happening, right? Ideally, you shouldn't see the chick hiding, hiding in the sand. And so this is the issue that they were having. So in the Oregon coast, in 1990, there was only two breeding colonies of these birds, and there was 33 birds total in the entire state of Oregon. They're um, protected under the ESA, and so what Oregon June started to do first is they focused on protecting the nest. So they put cages around the nest to protect it from predators like birds and small mammals. They use a lethal and non-lethal predator control, which means they just they either shoot birds or they scare off crows and things non-lethal methods. Um, they also move beach grass to make more room for them to nest. And by 2017, they had 285 chicks that were hatching and fledging. Um, but what they were finding is that once they hatched, they started to lose some of these young during the fledging stage. So they hatch, the mom's given up their care of them, the dads are taking care of them, they're running around the beach, but that's when they were losing a lot of their chicks. So they started to study what was causing this loss? What was impacting these birds the most? Um, and I know it's a little hard to see, but I'll give the answer away a little bit. So the blue, the dark blue are pedestrians, so that's like people walking on the beach. And green are dogs that are out there with people. So what's the biggest impact to this species? Dogs and people. Yeah, not the predators, that's part of it. Um, but most of it is going to be dogs and people walking on the beach. So what the Oregon Dunes started to do was they, they started to institute these beach restrictions for recreationists during the part of the year when they're breeding. And so they ban all these things, which are direct management techniques, just saying you can't do this, you have no choice. But then they started encouraging people to walk on the wet, hard-packed sand. Because again, these birds nest in the open sand, and then the males and chicks kind of run back and forth on the open sand up to the rack line. And so... Um, this is the message. If you want to protect these birds, walk on the wet sand. They also fenced off the, where they would find nests. Those nests appear, but you can't fence off the entire beach. Um, Oregon also has rules about beach right away so you can't really close the entire beach to recreation use in a lot of these places. So they created all this messaging and signs around where you can and cannot have dogs. So dogs are not allowed on clover beaches. Um, you can't have kites or drones because the birds think it's a, a hawk. Um, you can't have bikes. And again, you have to stay on this wet sand. But what do we know about wet sand? Is it just, does it just stay in the same spot? Yeah, the line of wet sand moves throughout the day with the tides. And this is a really confusing message for your average, everyday visitor who maybe has never been to the coast to understand. So they were finding that people were not walking on the wet sand. And they have this sign that they created, and I'm going to be honest, this is not a very good sign. Um, it's kind of too much text, it doesn't really give a clear message about where the wet sand is. And so what our study was trying to do was to test new signs. Can we come up with a better messaging strategy to protect these birds? Can we change people's behavior? This is another thing I like to do is hang out on tire tracks, not very safe. <laughs> so if you, if when the Forest Service is patrolling these beaches, they, they are allowed to drive on clover beaches um, for management, but they're never allowed to drive in the same tire track. So if they've driven out one way, they have to drive in a different area coming back. So this is our study site. This is Silk Coos Beach. Has anyone been to Silk Coos Beach? It's a nice beach. Um, 
So you can park here. This is all OHV use back in here, but this is the Clover Beach, and you hike over the dunes, and then you can walk here. And again, you want to, they want you to walk in the wet sand to protect the plovers. So what we did was my graduate student, um, Carly Schoenlieber, she defended in August, so she did a successful project. She created two new signs that we thought were better than the Forest Service signs to talk about these clovers and then measured how effective they were. So again, this was the original sign. This is one of Carly's signs. Now I know it looks like a lot of information, but again, I mentioned I get to tap into social science research sometimes. Communication research tells us that stories and storytelling are really engaging. Um, so we, if you learn anything about science communication, a lot of times they talk about how to tell your story. So one of the signs we tried and tested out was a sign that Carly created, which is a story. It looks like a comic strip, right? About this girl who goes to the beach, uh, she accidentally disturbs the plover, and is an animal lover and is really sad about it, learns about the plovers and grows up to be a park ranger. <laughs> And then this sign down here is information about how to behave. So keep out of the dry sand, stay on the wet sand. Um, and so this is a whole story. So if you can get people to read this, that's why you should read signs, it will <laughs> give you all the information and keep people engaged. Her other sign used something called norms. And norms are where we're kind of influenced by the people around us. So this sign says that 90% of the people, we made this number up, 90% of the people who visit Silk Coos stay on the wet sand. We didn't actually measure it yet, but if you think 90 people do it, do you want to be that 10% that's breaking the rules? No. So in the use of theory, again, we're showing these people are happy, they're on the wet sand, all the little snowy plovers are happy, chicks are safe. So that's what we did. So what we found, okay, so fun. what we found is that um, we had about 50 to 77 percent of visitors complying with that wet sand regulation with these new signs. So again, this is an endangered species, so still not perfect, but we did find that the new signs, especially the narrative signs, did a better job at keeping people on the wet sand. And that generally, we also surveyed them, we also found that visitors are generally concerned about these birds and supportive of management actions, which is good to know, because if you're a manager, if people are unsupportive, they're kind of less likely to follow your regulations. But here, they were like, yeah, we're concerned about this bird, we support management, so we're pretty sure that a lot of this non-compliance is just a lack of knowledge. So how do, we, how do we communicate this? How do we work with people? Our recommendations in the end was we, we still fence. The fences are working. Don't take down the fences. But maybe work on the communication plan a little bit more to kind of get back up to closer to 100% compliance. So, I think that's time. What would you guys do if you were the managers? What would you do? That's what I do in my classes. What would you do? You're the managers at Oregon Dunes. You're, you're tasked with protecting these clovers. Is there anything else you would do differently?
actually try to work on this a little bit by studying human waste impacts to benthic species um, up in Washington. So we're, my lab's trying to kind of help chip away at this a little bit. Um, recreation can have direct and indirect impacts. And there's other issues that are unique in impacting marine systems that kind of make recreation just one additional pressure on these systems. Um, so again, even though things like climate change and pollutants and commercial activities are pressures and, and important impacts, recreation causes impacts as well. So we don't, we don't want to forget about those. Um, and we found that in the Snowy Clover study, right? The biggest impact of those birds fledging was recreation. So that's all I got. Here's proof I actually do some research on the coast sometimes. Um, there are clovers down there, I promise. Uh, so yeah, my email's here. I'm over in Richardson Hall. Um, I'm on Twitter and I tweet mostly work-related stuff. And yeah, thank you so much for your attention. I didn't lecture at you too long and that you learned some things about recreation ecology. Yeah, so they're found throughout Oregon, and they're also found in California. The California populations are not increasing, the Oregon populations are. Um, so California um, folks are trying to use Oregon as a little bit of a model to see what, what are managers doing in Oregon that's working for those birds that aren't happening in California. Um, it could be just the sheer number of recreationists and beach users in California, but you can, their historic range was the entire um, California, Oregon, and Washington coast. They're really cute. I recommend going to try and see them. Let's stay on the wet sand. <laughs> Any other questions for me? I have one. Yeah. So what would you recommend to someone who wants to get involved in like projects like these? Yeah. Like what was your path? How did you get to where you are? Yeah, that's that's yeah, it's a big question then. No, it's so okay. Yeah, so funny thing, I wanted to be a marine biologist when I was a kid. Um, but I found that the, the human dimensions of things was super interesting. So I went to undergrad for ecology thinking I would learn more about that. And I did a little bit, um, but I was really, I wanted to help solve all these conservation issues. And I felt like it wasn't, my, my education wasn't really getting me there. And so um, I took two years to teach. <laughs> what I wanted to do and then um, human dimensions that term really can encompass any sort of human natural system interaction and so um, that's how I got into it and honestly the way I got into recreation ecology is I was looking for a human dimensions program and someone said to me I have a project in Rocky Mountain National Park do you want to work on that and I was like that sounds awesome <laughs> I'll do that so it was kind of a, just the opportunity came up and I'm a recreationist myself and it it seemed important. Um, here at OSU, again, we have an entire recreation program in the College of Forestry, so if this recreation and tourism stuff is interesting to you, um, check out some of the stuff in the College of Forestry. Again, other folks do, I'm the only recreation ecologist there, but there's other folks that do recreation-related work. There's human dimensions folks in fisheries and wildlife as well. So um, my path was kind of a, just took opportunities as they came up. I didn't know this is where I would be. <laughs> um, but it's really fun and really interesting. And yeah, I'd be happy to give you names and direct you to other folks who could, could um, answer other questions or tell you about their research or I'd be happy to chat with you more about other projects. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I do have a second one. Uh, so like if you are, say, visiting like a different state or country where you know that there's like a endangered species on the beach and like you know that some people may not be entirely educated on mm -hmm. it uh what would you like and if that person like you see somebody else starting to interact or even accidentally interact yeah. with uh this like endangered species what would you recommend we do to yeah. like, try to make it as peaceful as possible. Yeah, that is a great question. So have you guys heard of the Center for Leave No Trace? Have you heard of Leave No Trace? Leave No Trace is a set of principles to help you prevent impacts, but they have this entire guideline called Authority to Resource, which is, there's videos about it too, but I'll give you the basic gist of it, is you want to frame it as pu putting the power in the resource and not you coming to someone telling them what to do. So usually what you would do first is just go up to someone and break the ice. So like I've done this with people when they're hiking off trail. So I'll be like, oh, how are you enjoying your recreation visit? How's it going? Um, did you know that these vegetation can be impacted by trampling? Or do you know this species can be stressed out by you walking here on the sand? Um, to have a better experience, walk here. So the idea is not to like accuse someone of doing something wrong, but to start with this, this angle of giving 
explaining the resource, making the resource itself the focus and explaining the why. And then the important part is then giving an alternative. So instead of saying, oh, just don't do that, giving them some alternative. Or, oh, it's better if you just look at that thing. Or, oh, if you go over here, you can see this other resource or whatever it is. So explaining from the resource standpoint what the problem is. But if you Google authority of the resource LNT, there's a really awesome video where you could learn all the steps in more detail. <laughs> so that's the gist. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions for me?